Fast Cars, Celebs, and Betty White Kiss was bringing in millions of dollars in those days, and Jeanette and I did a pretty good job of burning through. A lot of it. We got rid of our three, bedroom apartment in Terrytown, New York, and bought a townhouse in nearby Irvington, where I built a recording studio in the attic and had a couple of trained Dobermans roaming the yard for protection against unwelcome guests. We moved out after a year because some fans and the press found out I was living there. Cameras would sometimes flash when I walked out the front door. One day I went right back inside and told Jeanette, we're getting the fuck out of this place. Next stop was a big spread in Connecticut, in the middle of the woods. I had just finished recording my first solo album and the Connecticut countryside seemed like just what the doctor ordered, a welcome escape from fans and photographers. We decided to purchase a five-acre estate in Wilton. Things were escalating on all fronts, and it seemed like a good decision at the time. Eddie Kramer's wife, Julie, actually helped us find the secluded place and we made the move in no time. While living there, Jeanette and I were happily married and a genuinely fun couple to be around except when we were fighting. We threw lots of big parties and barbecues, and on most weekends we entertained friends and family, they often wound up staying the entire weekend in our home. In July 1980 Jeanette gave birth to our lovely daughter, Monique, which necessitated hiring a nanny. We had already been through several maids by then, so we ended up with two welcome additions to the Frelly household. I'll never forget our housekeeper, Ellie. She was by far the best and funniest of the bunch. I can still hear her talking to Jeanette, I'm so sorry. I hope I'm not in trouble. I vacuumed up Mr. F's happy powder in the basement. There was always silly shit going on up there, with no shortage of alcohol and drugs. Wilton was our main home for more than seven years, although we also had an apartment in Midtown Manhattan. I paid only about $350,000 for the house and property, but I put another million into it, beautiful landscaping, stone walls with wrought iron gates and a cobblestone bridge with a waterfall. A small lake on the property I stocked with fresh trout, which made a delicious lunch from time to time. A long driveway led to a circular fountain and rock garden at the main entrance. Marble bathrooms and gold and crystal chandeliers made the place seem that much more luxurious. In the main entrance there was a giant 20-foot fireplace made out of stone and quartz. In the basement we had the front end of a vintage purple jaguar above the brick fireplace and a barroom with a giant projection television, pool, table, and professionally equipped wet bar. The driveway in the front entrance was home to a white Cadillac Eldorado, a stainless steel DeLorean, a black Porsche 928, and a brown metallic K-5 Chevy Blazer. They were all fighting for elbow room around the fountain. The very best thing about the Wilton estate was the recording studio I built right next to the house. It was unique and could be accessed either from the outside through a wall of glass, brick, and an 18-foot tall solid oak door, or through the basement of the house. The basement entrance had a giant plastic bubble skylight above the staircase that led to the control room. Inside, the studio was futuristic and plush, with a lot of glass and poured concrete and wood baffles. The control room was shaped in an octagon and was equipped with one of the first automated consoles available. Eddie Kramer helped me pick out most of the equipment and it was all pretty much state, of, the, art at the time. I worked with several different producers there, and recorded some original material, as well as some great jam sessions yet to be released. I'd like to let everyone hear some of those tapes sometime in the near future. When Kiss wasn't on the road or recording an album, I liked to retreat to Wilton and just hang out with my friends. The place was so big that I didn't even have to see other people who were there if I didn't want to. I could just stay in one corner of the house and isolate. My friends were a lot of the same people I'd known for years, people I could trust, or at least thought I could trust. I cherished them, actually, because they knew the real Paul Frelly. Not Ace, not the Spaceman. 
just Paul. Whenever I went out on the road, people treated me differently, because I was a rock star, but most of my friends understood that I wanted to be treated just like any other person. I really needed a vacation from the spaceman character for a while, because at times I felt like I was losing my identity. My privacy was important to me, and my friends understood that. I liked acting like an idiot without worrying about it ending up on the radio or in a magazine. I treated them well, too. I turned them on, paid for the cocaine, the pills, and got the best beer, champagne, and booze. I gave them money when they needed it, since most of them couldn't afford my lifestyle. I enjoyed doing that for my friends. A therapist, I suppose, could have a field day analyzing those relationships and questioning their health and the motivations of the various people involved. I never went that deep with it. These were my buddies and I liked hanging out with them. I liked getting loaded and having stupid, usually harmless fun. I wasn't alone in myself, indulgence. Peter bought a Mercedes and a mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut. Jean and Paul bought really nice places in Manhattan. We were all living life in the fast lane, but I was about to break the sound barrier without even giving it a second thought. With each successive tour, life on the road became more bizarre and surreal. When I wasn't touring sometimes I found comfort and refuge in the New York club scene. In the mid-70s New York's nightlife had reached a pinnacle of decadence. People were busy being fabulous, looking and dressing great, and saying things like why not do this, or try a little of that. A lot of money was being thrown around, New York in the mid, to late 70s mirrored some with the lives of many stars, writers, and artists of the 1920s and 30s. I was hitting a lot of clubs places like Trax, The Cat Club, Max's Kansas City, area, complete with its Shark Tank, Cafe Central, where my bartender at times was Bruce Willis, CBGB, and of course Studio 54. Steve Rubel had built the ultimate pleasure palace, and I became a regular guest there. If you were a VIP and liked to party, you made it a point to hang out at Studio 54 when visiting New York. If I ever ran out of drugs there, I could always visit Steve in his office and find a mountain of cocaine on his desk. He was always a friend and a gentleman. Gentleman to me, and was very generous with whatever he had. I hung out with most of the celebrities and rock stars who walked through the portals of Studio 54, I drank and did drugs with them. Danced with Lindsay Wagner, hung out with Keith Richards, Alice Cooper, Mick Jagger, and John Belushi, to mention just a few. I saw the giant bags of money and people doing drugs and having sex in the bathrooms and up in the balcony. For the right price you could have just about anything you wanted, from drugs to flesh. At that point in time Studio 54 sometimes felt like the center of the universe. Regardless of how decadent the behavior, nobody even batted an eye, because they were all just too fucking busy having fun. But even in the middle of the euphoria and glamour there was a strange feeling in the back of my mind that it would all be short, lived like a beautiful and grand soiree that slowly burned itself out. I had one girlfriend in those days who bore a striking resemblance to a Hollywood actress. Sometimes just for laughs, I'd call her up and say, we're going out. I'll pick you up in an hour. We're hitting 54. You know what to do. You want me to fix my hair? Uh, huh. By the time she got into the limo, this gal really looked the part, and when we'd pull up in front of Studio 54 and the doors would fly open, the paparazzi would go nuts. Hey. There's Ace Frehley with Natalie Wood. It was a riot fooling the fans and photographers who hung out all night outside the club just to get a quick glimpse of someone famous. Wherever I went, people were doing lines of blow in full view of everyone else, it was just the way the 70s was. It didn't seem unnatural to me, since just about everyone was doing it. I really can't think of anyone I associated with on a regular basis who wasn't at least a casual user. Well, okay, with a couple of notable exceptions, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. 
they were both anti-drug. Peter and I often drank and did drugs together, and as the band progressed it seemed to become more and more of a problem in their eyes. Peter's reliance on painkillers was particularly a big a concern to them, and his car accident in Los Angeles didn't help matters much. I was oblivious to a lot of the chaos, and really wasn't concerned with what most people thought. I was living the quintessential rock star life filled with sex, drugs, and rock and roll and didn't want to stop. I remember thinking that I probably wouldn't live past my early 30s. Peter and I had some epic nights of partying involving multiple women and enough cocaine to stop the strongest of hearts. The fact that we're both on this earth today, alive and kicking, seems like a small miracle to me. Peter was my kiss buddy, the only person in the band I ever considered to be truly a friend and someone I could trust. Interestingly enough, he's also the only person in the band with whom I ever engaged in an actual fist fight. It happened on an early tour, in Canada. I don't even remember what it was about I was mad about something and Peter was pissed off about something else. We just butted heads in the dressing room and one thing led to another and fists began to fly. Our road crew broke it up before anyone got hurt. We apologized to each other over a beer and the incident actually brought us closer together. We'd always come up with crazy ways to entertain each other on the road, some dangerous, some merely ridiculous. For a while Peter would do this character called Dr. Rosenblum. He'd dress up like this crazy doctor and put on a fake mustache and slick his hair back and do impersonations. His impression of Sinatra was terrific. When we didn't have guests it was usually just me and our two bodyguards enjoying the show. We'd sit around in Peter's room and get loaded and share lines, laughing our fucking asses off until the sun came up. On many occasions I also hung out with the guys in the road crew. Roadies and truckers would always be up for a good poker game, and I was always willing to host the game in my suite and cater the festivities. No one in the band ever played poker, so I didn't have much of a choice. I usually ended up winning the majority of those games, but when I lost I tried to be as gracious a loser as I was a winner. When we toured with other bands, invariably the band members would either end up in my room or Peter's room. The word got out that we had the best stuff and were throwing the best parties after the show. Party animals usually gravitate toward each other, and that was usually the case on a KISS tour. I have so many road stories, but one that always comes to mind is the tour we did in the summer of 1975 with Rush opening for us. I always liked Rush, and still do. After a few weeks on tour I started to get to know the guys in the band, and their very funny tour manager, Howie. One thing led to another and before long Peter and I were getting visits from the Rush boys. It usually turned into late evenings filled with beer and grass and whatever else was around. Alex Lifeson, the band's guitarist, used to do this hysterical routine with a large paper laundry bag. He'd draw a ridiculous giant face on the bag with a black marker and put it over his head with a couple of holes poked in it so he could see and breathe. Everyone in the room at this point was either drunk or stoned, but usually a little of both. Anyway, Alex would go into this routine with the bag over his head and while smoking a joint out of his eye he put everyone into total hysterics. He really milked the routine until everyone was gasping for air. The more popular Kiss became, the more security we needed, and our entourage swelled accordingly. We had advance men, bodyguards, managers, road managers, valets, etc. Along with various girlfriends and wives. For a while, before we began renting private jets, we flew commercially and usually took up all the first, class seating. Our personal bodyguards were guys you didn't want to tangle with. If anyone from coach tried to invade our space, which they almost always did, one of the bodyguards would just flash a look don't even think about it and that was usually enough to send them scurrying back to their seats. Our bodyguards were all trained security officers, but they also were great guys, really serious about their work and fun to hang out with. 
They'd all been around the business for some time and usually knew what to expect in any given situation. I trusted them completely, and put my life in their hands on more than one occasion. There was the time in St. Louis, for example, in the late 70s. It wasn't at all unusual when we flew into a city for our bodyguards to befriend members of the local law enforcement agencies. It was a smart thing to do, not only because you might need help with unruly fans or with traffic control at a show, but because afterward things sometimes got out of control back at the hotel or at a local club. The bodyguards knew we'd be in a better bargaining position if the local cops were on our side. We'd always accommodate the cops with autographed records, pictures, and t shirts, and take photos with them and their families as a courtesy for their support. So, this time in St. Louis, while we were in town on a day off, two off, duty cops came back to the hotel to hang out with us. One of them was packing a 45. After a few hours of sitting around and having a few drinks, I said, man, let's go out and find some action. Everyone agreed, but we ended up biting off more than we could chew. We ended up in a bar on the other side of the Mississippi River, which of course meant we had crossed state lines and jurisdictions. We'd been told the place was a rock and roll joint, but it ended up being more of a biker bar and they weren't too fond of out, of, state rockers. Peter and I stood outside the door, sizing up the atmosphere. Ah, fuck it, Peter said. He gestured to the cops and bodyguards. Who's gonna mess with us? So we went inside without reservation, unaware of what was about to go down. We all started drinking, shooting a few games of pool, and dancing with some of the local chicks. We were just starting to unwind and enjoy ourselves when things began to go wrong. Someone in our group, okay, it was me, supposedly made an improper advance toward one of the biker's girlfriends. The next thing I knew, guys were squaring off, cursing and threatening to fuck each other up. Usually, in a bar fight, it ends there, with both sides backing out of the brawl before it even has a chance to begin. But not in a biker bar at 1 o'clock in the morning. Not when you have a couple of cops and professional bodyguards on your side. Someone made a quick move and fists and bottles started flying. Things went out of control fast, and at one point my bodyguard Eddie pushed me up against the wall and, like a secret service agent, shielded me from a guy trying to smash a chair over my head. Eddie took the full impact, but it barely phased him. Things were escalating and a decision on what to do next needed to be made fast. Everyone fought as best as they could, but after a few minutes it became apparent that we were badly outnumbered. My bodyguards quickly decided it was time to split. They guided us out into the parking lot and threw us into the two limos that were waiting with engines running. The limo drivers burned rubber as we pulled away, and it took a while for everyone to calm down before we began to assess the damage. A few of us had minor cuts and bruises, but one of the cops had a three-inch gash in his head that was bleeding badly. And that wasn't the worst of it. Motherfucker, the injured cop said. They got my fucking gun. I'd known enough cops in my time to realize that this was a very big deal. Short of an accidental shooting, almost nothing is more embarrassing, and potentially more damaging, to a police officer than the loss of a gun. And when it happens while you're off duty, drinking in a bar, brawling with a bunch of bikers. Not good. Not good at all. We got back to the hotel and I let the injured cop wash up in my shower. We tried cleaning out the gash in his head, but it was obvious to everyone he needed stitches to stop the bleeding, so we ran him over to the hospital for some medical treatment. I felt bad that he had lost his gun, especially since he was trying to save my ass. I never found out exactly what happened to him, but I'll never forget what he did for all of us. I had been so preoccupied with all the commotion at the hotel and hospital that I hadn't realized my favorite motorcycle jacket was missing. Suddenly it hit me. I'd left the fucking jacket back in the bar. 
I need you to go back there and get it for me, I told my bodyguard, Eddie. And I don't care how much it costs to get back. Don't worry, Ace, he said. I'll get it, no matter what. I gave him a thousand dollars cash and said, don't come back without it. Like I said, these guys were fearless, and loyal. To someone outside looking in, it probably would have appeared to be a suicide mission, but about an hour and a half later Eddie knocked on my door with my jacket in his hand. What happened? I asked. He told me most of the dudes we'd brawled with had left for the night, but the bouncers were still there. All it took to get my jacket was a short apology and a little cash all in a day's work for Eddie. How much? I asked. I got it for 500. Is that okay, Ace? I laughed. I would have paid 2000 to get it back, Eddie. You keep the other 500 and let's call it a night. Talk to you in the morning, buddy. Good night, and thanks. Eddie was a good guy, and I know he went to bed that night with a smile on his face. Thinking back, I couldn't help but wonder how it all happened. When we'd left the hotel, I felt like we were untouchable, like no one would fuck with us. It just made me realize that you're never really safe, especially when you start to get fucked up and women are involved. You never know what's in the stars, but isn't that what makes life worth living? I've come close to dying on numerous occasions. Car accidents, overdoses, fights. Almost drowned, too. Twice, in fact. Oddly enough, given our love, hate relationship, Gene Simmons came to my rescue. The first incident happened at a hotel pool in Atlanta. It was a day off, on the road, and we were all hanging out poolside, soaking up the sun and enjoying life. I had had one too many beers that afternoon and shouldn't have been swimming. For no particular reason while I was treading water in the deep end of the pool, I remembered this funny old cartoon of Bugs Bunny. It's the one where he's dramatically going through the process of drowning. You know, dipping beneath the surface and holding up one finger. Then bobbing to the surface and going down again, this time holding up two fingers, and then three. I saw this in my mind's eye, and I started laughing my ass off, so hard that I began taking in water. All of a sudden I was hacking and spitting and gulping for air. And then I went under. Oh, fuck. I'm drowning. Luck interceded, as it often has in my life. Gene, sober as always, noticed I was in trouble and within seconds jumped into the pool and dragged me to the surface. Then he pulled me onto the pool deck and pumped the water out of me. Turns out Gene was actually a certified lifeguard when he was younger. Who knew? I'll never forget waking up with a hangover the next morning and the terrible taste of chlorine in my mouth. Then it hit me. I nearly drowned yesterday. Holy shit. And Gene saved my life. It was probably one of the few times that I was happier than a pig in shit over the fact that Gene was sober. I thanked him and walked away scratching my head, thinking to myself, did that really happen? And as luck would have it, Gene intervened a few years later and rescued me a second time. It happened one night after a show. I had decided to take a break from all the drinking and partying and just hang out in my room and take a warm bath. I took several tranquilizers to relax and while soaking in the hot water I dozed off. Unfortunately, I had forgotten to turn off the water and before long the tub started overflowing and began flooding the room, much to the dismay of hotel management. Gene must have had a premonition that night, since normally he would have been very busy entertaining one or two lovely ladies in his room, but to my surprise he came busting through the door with a security guard and pulled me out of the tub, but naked, just as the water level in the tub was about to reach my lips. Ace, he yelled. What the fuck are you doing? You could have drowned. I was even more surprised than everyone else, since I had been awakened from a relaxing sleep, it took me a moment or two to fully realize my predicament. I thought to myself, 
My God, I'm so irresponsible sometimes. When will I ever learn? I thanked Jean a second time for saving my ass and told him I'd be fine for the rest of the night. Jean didn't want to hear any excuses, and I believe he was genuinely concerned for my welfare. Even though I said I was okay, he tenderly helped me into my bed and tucked me in. He decided to sleep in my room that night and keep a watchful eye on the irresponsible spaceman. The following morning I woke up without any memory of the incident and when I saw Jean in the room I said, Hi, Jean. What are you doing here? I stayed in last night and just relaxed. What did you do? He just looked at me in amazement, realizing I hadn't remembered a thing about the night before and was unaware of how close I had come to drowning for the second time. Even when I got tired of being locked into the KISS formula with the pyrotechnics and special effects and lighting cues I still enjoyed performing live. But after a while even that lost some of its excitement, primarily because there was no room for spontaneity. We couldn't deviate much from the plan without risking bodily harm or at least messing up the show. After my accident in Florida, electrocution was always a fear. A bomb was gonna go off over here or some fire was going to ignite over there. And it was going to happen at a specific time in every performance. So you pretty much had to do the same shit every night, and that became a little tedious. I distinctly remember a few times in the late 70s daydreaming in the middle of a song. This was only halfway through the show, and I became totally detached my thoughts drifting away from the show as I began checking out chicks in the front row, wondering if I had enough coke and pills for the week, trying to remember if I had met anyone in town the last time I was here, signaling my bodyguards to give out invitations for our hospitality suite. Once I finished my smoking guitar solo, I usually went on autopilot and thought more and more about events that were going to occur back at the hotel after the show. I don't think the word board applies here as much as the term spaced, out. When you know what's always going to happen, you start looking for other things to excite your senses and occupy your thoughts. That started happening to me on occasion, and I just went with the flow. You can become accustomed to almost anything, and too much of a good thing can sometimes make it seem less appealing. On other occasions, though, I let the good times roll without a care in the world, taking in every sensual experience. I remember playing a big outdoor festival in Atlanta. I was given a gigantic suite in the hotel and I filled it up with a dozen southern bells, all of whom wanted to show me their gratitude for my performance. I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to entertain everyone concerned. Luckily a very popular local DJ assisted me in the selection process and helped me indulge in the fruits of my labors into the early hours of the morning. I didn't have anything on this guy when it came to staying power. He was over the edge, and the two of us ended up sharing a half, dozen chicks through the course of the evening, drinking and doing lines of coke off their breasts and naked torsos, screwing until we were so. Numb we had nothing more to give. We both eventually passed out among several naked bodies, only to be awakened by the sensitive caresses of the opposite gender wanting breakfast treats. It was an experience most men will only fantasize about. Kiss's popularity was reaching its peak in the South around this time, and even while everything was going on that night, I sensed I'd never have such an over, the, top experience of Southern hospitality again. And I was right. After months of being catered to by so many different people and visiting so many different places, the road became a blur. Once in a while, though, Certain nights would stand out either because of the pure ecstasy of the event, or because I came dangerously close to losing it all. The next story is an example of the latter and involves an enormous stroke of luck. No pun intended, or maybe just a little. We refer to it as the golf club affair. It involved me, Peter, and Don Wasley. As I mentioned earlier, Don was the VP of Artist Development for Casablanca Records, Peter and I affectionately nicknamed Don the director. The story begins back at the hotel after a show. We rendezvoused for some drinks and lines, not expecting anything out of the ordinary. 
The next thing you know we were joined by three chicks. From the looks of these gals it appeared we were in store for a very accommodating evening. Alcohol, cocaine, and quaaludes filled the next hour or two as we savored the fruits of these lovely ladies. Later some of us got hungry and decided to have a snack. Since we were in the hospitality suite there was a long table of food just there for the taking. After we ate we started painting the girls' bodies with the onion dip and salad dressing, thinking it might liven things up a bit. The event quickly evolved into a contest for the best body painting design. Another hour passed, and after a few showers some of us started losing interest. Don, for one, had turned his back on his female canvas and begun practicing his golf swing. Peter had put on a cape and was diving off the furniture into God knows what, pretending to be Superman. I was bent over the table doing a line of blow when all of a sudden I heard a cracking sound, and out of the corner of my eye I watched the girl near Don hit the floor with a thud. Don had been unaware of her approach from behind, and had clocked her on the side of the head with his golf club. She hit the carpet like dead weight. I remember looking at Don, and I remember Peter saying, Holy shit. What a fucking shot. Being completely wasted, we all started laughing, but within seconds our laughter quickly turned into deep concern for her well, being, since she wasn't moving. I remember thinking to myself, what? A fucked up way to end such a great party. I could just imagine the headline, groupie killed in hotel suite by golf club. Don had a look of grave concern on his face, since he was looking at a lengthy prison sentence if she was in fact dead. Time stood still for a moment as we tried to revive the fallen angel. Suddenly a slight moan rose from her mouth as she rolled over onto her back. With half, opened eyes she slowly raised her head, and with a deep breath sat up on the carpet. Seconds later, with a bewildered look on her face, she spoke. What the fuck was that? I said to her, sorry, baby. Are you okay? Don was practicing his golf swing and I guess you eluded his peripheral vision. Within no time she was back on her feet, bent over the table snorting another line of coke, oblivious to how close she had come to dying. We just looked at each other in amazement, thinking, shit, what a fucking close call. Our guardian angels must have been watching over us that night. The sun was coming up and the party continued until we all fell asleep. So many close calls, so many disasters averted. I have no idea how or why I'm still around. I took so many chances and pushed the envelope of fate so far, sometimes it almost seems like these things never really happened. But they did, and I'm just thankful I lived to talk about it and learned from my mistakes. There was the time in a large southern city, for instance, when we trashed a hotel room in grand style. Peter was there, getting down with one of Rock's best, known groupies, a chick named Sweet Sweet Connie from Arkansas, who was immortalized in the Grand Funk Railroad song We're an American Band. I was feeling very lovable that evening and jumped into bed between Peter and Connie, but after a few minutes it was apparent I was an unwelcome guest, so I retreated to the safety of my room, where another party was beginning. My friend Donnie from Westchester showed up, why in the name of Christ was Donnie down there? I have no idea. And the fourth person was a famous stock car driver who shall remain nameless, let's just say he was a big deal at the time. And this was the Deep South, remember, where stock car drivers were treated like, well, like rock stars. So the party progressed as it usually did, with a lot of alcohol and cocaine and whatever, until I came up with the brilliant idea to begin tossing the furniture out the window. Now, I did not invent this concept, but I did almost perfect it. My buddies looked a little unwilling. At first to participate, especially since we were 20 stories up and my windows faced out onto a busy street. But once I began the festivities by grabbing a lamp and hurling it out the window, they quickly decided to go along with the plan. Next went a wooden chair, and an end table. Then a desk flew out the window, followed by a television set. 
Each item exploded spectacularly crack. When it hit the street below, splintering in all directions and terrifying passers-by. Next we somehow maneuvered a love seat through the open window. Again, we could have killed someone, but I don't recall thinking it was anything but hilarious at the time. The severity of our actions didn't occur to me, until our road manager, Frankie Sinlero, came running into the room, panicked and breathless. Are you guys out of your fucking minds, he asked. The cops are on their way. Uh, oh, I said between giggles. No, man, this is serious. He pointed at Donnie and the stock car driver. You guys get the hell out of here. I started to leave with them. It's your room, Ace, Frankie pointed out. They're going to find you. What do you want me to do? Get in bed, get under the covers, keep your fucking mouth shut. Let me do the talking. The state troopers arrived just minutes later and I eagerly listened to the conversation from under the sheets, while pretending to be asleep. They were ready to take me away without discussion, and who could blame them? There was furniture flying out of my room like missiles. But Frankie, God rest his soul, handled the whole thing like a pro. Frankie was a crazy fuck, and had seen it all and could bullshit with the best of them. Frankie had also rode, managed Alice Cooper before coming on board with Kiss, so he knew a little something about Rockstar Excess. Kiss, though, was almost too much even for Frankie. I'm sorry, officer, I heard him say. Ace had a party with a lot of people in his room, but unfortunately he drank a little too much and passed out in his bed hours ago he's not the guilty party here, and people have been in and out of this room all night. I don't even know most of them. Ace was just trying to give back some southern hospitality. He had nothing to do with these assholes who tossed the furniture. Believe me, he'll be pissed when he wakes up in the morning. Incredibly enough, they bought it. Or they didn't buy it, but just didn't care enough to make an example of me. Especially since there were no witnesses, and no one was actually injured in the whole insane episode. Kiss had that kind of clout. Either way, without Frankie's intervention, I'm sure I would have ended up in jail that night. Instead I lay there for a while, relieved and thankful for Frankie's skills of persuasion, wondering what adventures awaited me in the next city, and whether I would be so lucky. During the 1970s and 80s most people who were doing a lot of cocaine usually came up with some sort of code name or alias for the word coke, especially when talking about it on the telephone, you never knew if the phone was bugged. In my social circle, names came and went, but the one that remained my favorite over the years was Betty White. If I was talking to a friend on the phone and wanted to know if there was going to be cocaine at a particular party, I'd just say hey. Is Betty going to be at the party? We always laughed about it when we met face, too, face, and how could you not? I mean it's just too fucking funny for words, and so is the real Betty White. I love her to death, and think she's the most underrated female comedian on the planet. Alcohol and drugs were my constant companion, my best friend and worst enemy. Sometimes they were a detriment to my career and personal life. Overall, I guess, you'd have to argue they were mainly a bad thing in as much as they nearly killed me. Sometimes, though. Being loaded worked to my advantage, as it did on October 31, 1979, when Kiss made a memorable Halloween night appearance on NBC's Tomorrow Show. Hosted by the friendly and sometimes confrontational Tom Snyder, Tomorrow was a popular and successful late, night talk show that attracted some of the biggest names in politics and show business. Hey John Lennon did Tomorrow. How could Kiss turn it down? Well, we couldn't, and our appearance was one for the ages. I was nervous as hell about going on network TV live. In front of millions of people. So I started pounding some stoli in the back of my limo as soon as it passed through my gates on the way to the city. Now, I might have been a formidable drinker in those days, but I wasn't really a vodka drinker. 
the bottle was nestled in the door of the limo and I reached for it to escape the anxiety I was feeling. By the time we arrived at the NBC studios in Rockefeller Center, I had a pretty good buzz on and all my nervousness had subsided. When I got into the dressing room, Bill Ockoin showed up with a bottle of champagne, and I had a glass with him and Jeanette. Just before I left the dressing room I snorted a few lines of blow to balance off all the alcohol and give me a little etch. By the time we took our places opposite Tom, on the set, in full kiss costume and makeup, I was feeling. Feeling no pain. And I was ready for anything. My amusement began with an introductory voice, over, during which Snyder described our act, and in the process referred to Gene as the bass player. As in, small, mouthed, large, mouthed, striped or Chilean C. By the time he got around to me I could barely contain my amusement. So, when Tom said, this is Ace Frehley, lead guitarist, I responded with, I'm not the lead guitarist, I'm the trout player. And then I cracked up, and so did Tom, much to the chagrin of Paul and, especially, Gene. Hey, Gene B. would the first to admit that he is a control freak. So is Paul. They always wanted to control Kiss, and they wanted to control me. But I had talent and a mind of my own, and had different ideas about the direction of Kiss. Gene and Paul were caught in this dichotomy, oh, fucking ace. We love him, we hate him. We don't want to put up with his bullshit anymore, and he doesn't want to put up with ours. But we can't get rid of him because the fans love him. You're supposed to be some sort of spaceman, right? Tom asked me at one point, while gesturing to my costume. No, actually I'm a plumber. Snyder laughed from the gut, and fired right back, Oh, well I've got a piece of pipe backstage I'd like to have you work on. A hanging curveball if I ever saw one. Regardless, I completed the R-rated joke with the delivery of a major, Legal, star. Tell me about it. There was no live audience in the studio, but just about everyone there, including the crew, doubled over with laughter. If you watch the video you can actually see me turning to Jean and putting my hands up at one point and quietly saying, what, like a child who's misbehaving at a family function and wants his dad to loosen up and join in the fun. Jean was sometimes incapable of that, even in a setting that clearly called for some spontaneity and horsing around. It was all so ridiculous. How seriously can you take yourself when you're sitting there in a superhero costume and full face makeup? Gene missed the whole thing. If he would have allowed himself to be just a little more light-hearted about everything, and stopped fucking thinking about money all the time, things might have turned out differently. I love the guy, but he never, ever got it. You could have cut the air in that studio with a knife. Tom picked up on Gene's negativity, and you could tell he wasn't digging it. At one point Gene tried to make a joke about selling Tom some swampland in New Jersey, and Snyder completely ignored him and turned his attention. Attention back to me. It was like Gene didn't exist. Tom Snyder may have been a newsman, but he realized very quickly that it was more entertaining to let me laugh and tell jokes than it was to allow Gene to bore everyone with his uptight humor. Afterward, I got tons of phone calls congratulating me on my performance. You were a fucking riot, Ace. You stole the show. Yeah, that was a classic performance, and it might have been the first time that a single appearance so clearly delineated the diverse personalities of KISS. The show speaks for itself and that's all I'm going to say about it. Everyone should judge for themselves what really happened. I enjoyed myself on the show and really wasn't trying to piss off anyone. I was just being the space ace. After the interview, Tom came back to my dressing room and we shook hands and had another good laugh. I thought he was very genuine, and he seemed to really enjoy the experience. Being a rock star provided access to people and relationships I never would have known otherwise. My friendship with John Belushi certainly falls into this category. I met John one night at Peter's Pad in the city. 
Peter lived on the east side with his wife, Lydia. And I was always a welcome guest in their home. I walked in and John was just kicking back on Peter's couch, having a cold beer and making small talk. We all exchanged greetings, and I cracked open a cold one as well. A few beers later the obvious question arose, did I have any coke? In those days I almost always had at least a few grams of blow on me, but on that particular night I had just scored some really good shit. Once I announced the good news, everyone in the room rose to attention and proceeded to partake of the sparkling powder. More lines and cold beer filled the next hour or two, with jokes flying back and forth across the room until we were all laughing hysterically. Lydia was always a lot of fun to be around, we had the same sense of humor, and shared a lot of inside jokes about the band. She was with Peter from the beginning, and over the years had become a trusted friend and confidant. I could usually make her laugh at the drop of a hat, but what was more interesting to me was that John seemed to be laughing at almost all my jokes. I had been told for years that I was a funny guy, but to be making a professional comedian crack up felt even more rewarding. There's a strange bonding process that happens sometimes between two people when alcohol and drugs are involved. That bond was cemented that evening between me and John, and remained that way. Until the end. We were both famous, and we both loved music and comedy, and we also enjoyed getting fucked up. John and Kiss rose to prominence on parallel lines. He was one of the breakout stars of Saturday Night Live in its first few seasons, beginning in the fall of 1975. While Kiss was selling out arenas and stadiums around the world in the late 1970s, John was in the process of becoming a movie star as well, first with Animal House and then with the Blues Brothers. John used to take me down to his private bar, south of Canal Street, which he owned with fellow Blues brother Dan Aykroyd. What a trip that was. Those guys liked to party, obviously, and yet they really couldn't go out in New York without getting harassed by fans for autographs or photo opportunities, which was another thing we had in common. John and Dan bought their own bar and sealed the windows with cinder blocks, a steel door with a peephole served as the front entrance. To the average passerby, the building looked almost abandoned. That was the beauty of the club, it was never technically open. They used it primarily on Saturday nights for a hangout and to entertain guests after the show. Anyone driving or walking by on a Saturday night or Sunday morning might have thought it was a mob hangout, because the street would be filled with stretch limousines, but in reality. Reality the bar was filled with the cast and guests of SNL. I was there on some of those nights, and the parties were great but a little too crowded for my tastes. During the week, though, the place was dead and for me that was a dream come true. I mean just imagine how cool it would be to have your own private bar in Manhattan to hang out in and do whatever you wanted. I'd get behind the bar and act like a bartender for John and any other guests we had invited. Then we'd switch places, tell some stupid jokes, and knock over the drinks. We'd clean off the bar, lay down too, foot lines of cocaine, and try to snort them in one breath. Then we'd dance on top of the bar, or ask some girls I had invited to do a strip tease while John and I played the guitar and drums on the little band stand. It was total decadence, and we enjoyed every second of it. I can remember staggering outside with John one time in the early morning hours, climbing into my Porsche and driving to a nearby deli for a beer run, yes, we'd drunk all the beer in the bar, and passing out in the car in front of the deli, only to be rudely awakened by businessmen and secretaries on their way to work. They'd be looking into the windows of my black 928, curiously trying to figure out who the disheveled occupants were. John and I just laughed at them, saying, in effect, you suckers. Fuck you and your jobs. We don't have to work this. Morning. And so it went on, sometimes for days on end. I remember calling up Jeanette one morning after one or two nights out with John and hearing screams on the other end of the phone. Jeanette was understandably pissed, but I knew she was also a huge fan of both John and SNL. I thought to myself, 
If I put John on the phone with Jeanette maybe he could calm her down and buy me some time. John got on the phone and launched into his famous Marlon Brando impersonation from a streetcar named Desire. John started yelling Stella. 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 After his routine was finished he also told her he needed me to coach him on an upcoming skit on the show. Within a few minutes Jeanette's anger had melted away. She told John it was okay for me to stay out for another day. We went back to the bar or my apartment or someone else's apartment and continued the party till we passed out again. The most memorable story I can share about John is one that reflects the guy's inherent sensitivity and insecurity. You see, like a lot of performers, John wasn't quite the egomaniac he appeared to be on stage. Or, at least, I don't think he was. I was at the Palladium, formerly the Academy of Music, one night in the summer of 1980, shortly after. The Blues Brothers movie had come out. Belushi and Aykroyd had embarked on a legitimate concert tour, with a great backup band, and anybody who was anybody in New York was at the Palladium on 14th Street that night to see the Blues Brothers in action. They played for about 40, 5 minutes, then took a break, with the understanding that they'd come back out and do a second set. I was hanging out backstage with a date and all the other celebrities when I got the word that no one was allowed in the dressing room to visit the Blues Brothers. Suddenly the promoter, Rondell's Enner, came running up to me. Ace, we have a big problem. What's up? I said. Ron told me John didn't want to go back out to do the second half of the show, supposedly because his voice was shot. What can I do? I asked. Ron said, can you try talking to him? I told him you were here. Dell's Enner paused, then gestured toward my date for the evening, a very tall and lovely New York model. With your friend. Okay, I said. I'll give it a shot. As I proceeded to go upstairs to the dressing room, everyone who was milling around backstage looked up at me with amazement. I could hear some of them saying under their breath, how come Ace can get in to see John and Dan, and we can't. Paul and Jean were also part of the crowd, looking confused. My model friend was wearing a very short skirt that night, and you could easily see her sheer underpants as we ascended the stairs, adding insult to injury to some of the onlookers. A minute later I was in the dressing room, asking John how he was feeling. He shook his head. I don't know, man, my fucking voice is shot. I can't sing. I just smiled. His voice sounded terribly hoarse and I suggested he drink some hot tea with honey. While he sipped the tea I tried to cheer him up with a few stupid ace jokes, then I hiked up my friend's dress to lift his spirits. Come on, John, I said. You don't want to disappoint the Big Apple, do you? He just looked at me his face filled with sadness and fatigue. I don't think I can do it, Ace. I chuckled. Hey, nobody really gives a shit. Stop worrying. I can't sing, either. I just fake it most of the time, but I get out there anyway. Hell, Mick Jagger can't sing. Dylan can't sing. They just kinda talk the... words. Everybody does it in rock and roll, especially when they're on tour and they blow out their voice. Remember, the show must go on, and you're a professional. John smiled. I guess. Right. Just talk your way through it. Everyone out there loves you. It'll be great. We joked around a little more and had a beer and did a few lines of coke. Slowly John's mood began to change for the better. After a few more lines and a little female entertainment, John decided he would finish the show. I told John to knock M dead and I'd see him after the show. I left the dressing room smiling, and informed Dell's Enner that the show would begin shortly. Ron was so thrilled he hugged me and said, I can't thank you enough. I guess that's why they call you the ace. You really saved the fucking day. I owe you one, buddy. In the winter of 1982 I got a call from John, 
as I did on occasion, usually when he was in town and wanted someone to hang out with or needed some blow. I wasn't available at the time, and here's why, he'd caught me during one of my cleansing periods. This was something I did from time to time, probably out of instinct, and I honestly believe it's the only reason I'm alive today. I would take a break from the self, abuse, give myself a chance to come back from the precipice. Even on the road with Kiss, I sort of knew how much my body could take before I'd need a rest. Sometimes I'd look at the calendar, notice we were going to be in a particular city for three or four days, and I'd shut everything down. No alcohol, no cocaine, no painkillers, no sex. I'd put a sign on my door saying quarantined by the Board of Health, and then I'd take a bunch of tranquilizers and sleep for two days. My bodyguards gave everyone strict orders not to call or knock on my door. That allowed me to recharge my batteries. I'd usually wake up refreshed, take a hot bath, have some breakfast, and start the whole crazy cycle all over again, feeling as though I'd bought myself a little more time. When John called me, he had just flown in from California, where he had been working on what would be his last film, Neighbors, and was going to be in town for only a couple of days. Come on, Ace, he said. Let's hook up in the city. Sorry, John. Can't do it. I'm cleaning up for a while. I just need a break from the insanity. I remember him laughing on the other end of the phone. I suppose it did sound funny, the idea of me not wanting to party. A break from the insanity. What do you mean? I was MR. Insanity, from outer space. I must admit his offer was tempting, and I hadn't seen him for weeks, but I had been burning the candle at both ends and just wanted to stop feeling like shit for a little while. I also wanted to relax and hang out with my two, year, old, daughter, Monique, and be daddy for a while. Also, don't forget I'm a Taurus through and through. Once I've made up my mind, that's it. I very rarely reverse a decision. We had a few more laughs and eventually he decided to give up and make other plans. He told me he'd call when he got back from El Dote. On the next run, and then said good, bye. I didn't realize that would be the last time I'd ever speak to John. If I had known, I would have dropped everything and met him in the city, no questions asked. A few weeks later I was watching the news when I heard that John had died of a drug overdose in Los Angeles. I was in complete shock, an overwhelming feeling of sadness came over me. I was never going to see him again. I had become very fond of John, and suddenly I realized all the fun we had together was over. He had told me a few months earlier that he wanted to put me in his next film, since I was one of the few people who could always crack him up. Now it was just a dream. We had a mutual admiration. John Belushi was a great guy and a gifted performer. I feel very lucky to have known him. His death was a tragedy and was the catalyst for me to clean up my act for several months afterward. I still think about the crazy times we had together and get a smile on my face, I just wish things could have turned out differently. John was a comedic genius and no one has ever been able to fill his shoes. He was unique. I miss him. I think everyone does.